All right, welcome back to the Comp Bio Cafe. We're your host, Melissa. And Janae. And today we're excited to chat with Dean Lee about creating a Comp Bio portfolio and Figure One Labs. As a reminder, if you have any questions or comments to share, please email them to podcast at blackwomancompbio.org or leave us a voicemail at 1-302-715-2922. We may share your response here during the show. All right, so first we're going to get started with some news. I saw that Melissa Davis posted on LinkedIn that Morehouse is getting a Institute for Translational Genomics, which she will be directing, I believe, and it is the first institute of its kind at an HBCU. So I'm really excited to see what comes out of her work and just broadening it outside of like cancer genomics, which is what she tends to focus on there. Yeah. And I think that we've been seeing maybe some of these plans for a while, but I didn't know beforehand that it was going to be the first HBCU to do something like this. And it's really nice to just see that we're emphasizing a lot of that infrastructure and the undergraduate space specifically for HBCUs. Yeah, I think it'll definitely lay the framework for other HBCUs to set up similar translational genomics institutes. And probably there'll probably be a lot of people wanting to collaborate with the institute, trying to get grants together and stuff. So, yeah. And I hope that it becomes, well, I see CZI as one of the partners, but I hope that it becomes a hub also for where people want to go and train. I think sometimes people might see HBCUs as like a lot of teaching experience you'd get, you know, working with undergraduates, but maybe not as many resources in place for like a postdoc or for people to kind of train after undergrad or after grad school. So I hope that this these fundings allow people to see this type of HBCU as a destination for training so that we can also circulate more talent throughout that pipeline. All right, well, let's go ahead and introduce our speaker for today. Dean started his graduate training in neuroscience studying the developing mammalian cortex, but he decided to switch to computational biology when he witnessed how next-gen sequencing is forcing the life sciences through a data revolution. He now queries this data to guide immuno-oncology drug development in biotech, and he thinks a lot about how the industry can better bring computational biologists of all levels to do meaningful work. To this end, he created Figure One Lab, an initiative to help aspiring computational biologists build compelling portfolio projects for biotech and pharma roles. Welcome, Dean Lee. Yeah, thanks for having me here. <laughs> that was a really good introduction. So we ask all of our guests this same question. So what is your relationship to computational biology? So I started out as that guy in college who didn't want to do any math or statistics. So I just did the bare minimum to graduate with my biology degree. Went to grad school, was entirely working at the bench for my thesis work. And like you had mentioned briefly in the introduction, I just didn't get the kind of regular feedback from my experiments at the bench because they take so long to do. And I had joined a lab that was very much a in vivo neural development lab. So you just had to wait for the animal to grow up. And so I found that I just was a little bit bored and also kind of just stressed out by how long everything was taking. And so I was looking for what, what are other things that I can do in biology as a biologist that would give me much quicker turnaround. And so I looked at computational biology and I figured out, you know, maybe now's the time I need to learn to code actually. Uh, and then that was also the same time around 2016, 2017, when every other lab is doing a, a single cell RNA seq on their tissue of choice. And all this data was coming out, right? These postdocs and grad students were generating more data than they've ever seen. And no one really knows what to do with that data because everyone is still working in Excel. 
And uh, when I, in 2018, I had joined a neuroscience lab and I inherited an analysis for RNA, RNA-seq data that was entirely done in Excel. And I was like, okay, my this God. is my chance Hell. to do <laughs> this in R. And then uh, I have something, then I can have something to show for it. And if this works out, then I can maybe transition into an industry job where mm-hmm. people will actually pay me to do the same thing. So that's what I did. <laughs> and and in my learning journey, I I took advantage of most of these free tutorials. And there weren't as many back then in 2017, but there were some like university offered workshops that were really helpful to me. And then also I learned from the one other scientist in my lab who did do some computational work and basically just asked him a lot of questions and squeezed every bit of insight I could from his code. That actually was the most helpful thing for me is to see his code and go through it line by line to understand why he did what he did and how he got his results. Mm -hmm. So then fast forward to 2019, I went to work in a company in Cambridge, Massachusetts called Hi-Fi Biotherapeutics. It's an immuno-oncology company that develops antibody drugs for cancer patients. And there I got to work a lot on single cell RNA-seq data. And that was one of the main emphases of the company is that they wanted to look at cells in tumors or in the, in, it, in the patient immune system at a single cell level, one cell at a time. And then in 2022, so not that long ago, then I transitioned to a a similar computational biology role at Novartis, where I am at now. And there my focus is on the cell therapy initiatives that Novartis has. And it, for me, that was, it was actually a really nice transition because now the single cell RNA-seq data readout that we do is actually on the drug itself because the drug is, are the cells. And so that was really kind of nice to see. Wow, that's I think a really interesting trajectory. I think I've, I think it it sounds like you know really needing to understand and analyze a data set that was before you kind of pushed you into the computational end, and also maybe it helped that you didn't have to work with a an animal <laughs> anymore during that journey. I guess like what was important to you in terms of just growing as a scientist. So you you mentioned like having that person who you were kind of expanding their project on, being able to see how they were doing their code or, you know, analyzing the data. But maybe my real question is, how has your ability to grow in the comp bio field evolved as you've continued on your different roles? Yeah, I think in 2017, when I realized I actually needed to learn R, it was a lot of fear because I just didn't know if I could do it, because I had never done anything like it before. And I wasn't sure if, is this going to take me like six months or six years? At which point I'm going to be so broke that I have to find something else to do. And, and at some point, I, I don't know what enabled me to do that, but I just decided that, you know, I'm probably, I'm probably capable of just doing this. It's just a matter of time. I just need to sit down and put in, I don't know how many, maybe 100, maybe 200 hours, maybe that's all it takes to do some very minimal computational work to prove to myself that this can happen. Mm -hmm. And I think I had such a hard time in with with my thesis work in grad school that Mm -hmm. I kept using that to motivate myself as in, you know what, like whatever this thing I'm doing right now, it's not going to be harder than working with these mice. Like I've done harder things. That's, that's what I kept telling myself. So, right. and then over time, that attitude has really helped me not be as afraid of learning brand new things, which as you know, in computational biology, it's, it's a constant. You, there, someone's publishing a new method every other day. And then someone's asking you, well, have you seen this method? Should we try it? Does it even work? Mm-hmm. And it, on the one hand, it, it pushes me out of my comfort zone to and engage with that new method. But on the other hand, there's also a kind of maybe a sense of security and knowing that I've done similar things like this before to assess a brand new thing and to pick up something very quickly and get to a a decision about how something's going to work fairly quickly. 
Mm-hmm. And so over time, I think that, I guess you could say it's a kind of a confidence mm-hmm. and comfort with new technology and computational biology that's definitely helped me navigate situations at work as well. Nice. And being around coworkers who are very comfortable doing that also helps. Because then if right. I, yeah, because I always need someone to tell me that I'm not like stupid, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I think this tool yeah. doesn't work, but what if I'm just missing something really major? And I right. just, I have like one or two people that I bounce ideas off of to just double check. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So how has that kind of essence kind of propelled you toward creating the initiative Figure One Lab? It sounds like, you know, you've really thought a lot about how we as computational biologists learn and adapt to new challenges, which is true, right? I think, you know, not every data set's going to be the same. Not every collaboration is going to look the same. We're not always going to be running like the same repertoire of tools. And I do think there is a uniqueness there and how we grow and contribute to different teams. But how did you kind of, how did that, you know, inspire you to create Figure One Lab and and what is it? Yeah, so Figure One Lab is an initiative that just started earlier this year, where it's a collection of resources as a, in the form of a GitHub repo that helps people break into computational biology work in biotech pharma. Or actually, it could work for academia as well, but I feel like the bar is a little bit lower to get into these industry roles. Mm -hmm. And my motivation in creating it was actually based on conversations I've had with people. So last year, last summer, I wrote a a short article outlining how to get an industry computational biology job in collaboration with the Career Services Center at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And after that, the article was published, then people reached out to me individually to ask me more questions like, okay, I, this is exciting. I want to do this. I still don't know how to get started. And so I realized more guidance and more explicit instructions need to be given to help people to break into this field. And then also thinking back to my own experience, I just didn't have a whole lot of help along the way. I feel like I groped in the dark a lot of times. And then I also got a little bit lucky in getting into industry as a computational person. And so I was creating this resource with my, you know, 2017 self in mind. Like what would that version of Dean would have appreciated having? Mm -hmm. And so that's how I designed Figure One Lab. And and I was looking around at, you know, learning resources for people who want to get into Comp Bio. And there are tons of them. I mean, there are, There are tons of GitHub repos where they also list collections of other GitHub repos of all these resources you can go through. And I realized no one's probably going through these because this is too many. It's too overwhelming. You wouldn't even know where to start. And that was the feedback I got from some of these conversations I had from people who read my article last year. And so it was this decision paralysis that stops people from even getting started. And so, and then also the, the other shortcoming with a lot of these online tutorials and workshops and training materials is that they, they end with a plot that you can interpret and maybe that can go into, you know, a lab meeting presentation, but it's not designed to help you get a job. And, and so there's that, there's still a pretty big disconnect in what you get out of these training materials versus what you need to get a job. And, and as you know, for computational biology roles, most, in most cases, when you interview, you basically had to give a re- research presentation of your work. Right. And if you had yeah. done a PhD and a postdoc, then that's, that comes pretty naturally because you already have a body of work, a full mm-hmm. story to present. But for more junior scientists, they may not even realize that they have to have that story to tell. And so that's what I'm thinking of when I'm thinking of a, a compelling portfolio project, mm-hmm. which is a, a, a well-defined project that becomes a story that you can convert into 20 slides to mm-hmm. talk about to a scientific audience for about 45 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like I've been talking for a long time. <laughs> Are there <laughs> elements in there you wanted me to expand? Because I have a lot more to say. No, yeah, yeah. 
what the portfolio project should look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it seems like this would be really helpful for junior professionals that are trying to get into the field or even more senior professionals that are trying to switch into a more comp bio role. Can you walk us through the process of how these aspiring computational biologists engage with figure one labs? Like what's, what are the logistics? How do they get started? Yeah. So you go to the GitHub repo called figure one lab. There's a link to it on my LinkedIn profile as well. And basically the ingredients in on, there's a readme on that Git, GitHub repo page that describes basically how you, how you should use the materials there. And I'll walk through it now briefly. So there are, for a compelling new comp bio portfolio project, I think there's a couple of ingredients. The number one thing is you need a, an interesting biological question. So, you know, not how wing disks in Drosophila develop in the first like two days after, um, yeah. after the someone, like, someone may find Rush that interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Did either of you study Drosophila development? In undergrad, no. not development, no. but I worked with Drosophila. Yeah. yeah. But, <laughs> but you know, like wh when you're crafting your portfolio project, the yeah. everything's available to you. Or you have the full freedom to pick a topic that you want to work on. So you might yeah. as well pick a topic that's related to human health, because to get into an industry role, we're always going to be dealing with a, a disease or a, a, a condition of some sort that that company is making a drug for. So number one is biological question. Number two is the data that you need to address that question. So that needs to be identified upfront. And then number three is what are the methods you're going to use to analyze that data to address your biological question. And I think because there's so many questions, there's so many uh, types of data out there that you can work with. There's so many methods that you can use that it becomes this immense space that people can't decide what to start with. And so figure one lab has done everyone a favor. And I basically picked a handful of topics with a handful of methods that you and, and very clearly defined data sets that you can use to start asking it, building your portfolio project. So for example, I have one paper on there that talks about human cortical organoids, which I never really studied, but I just thought it was really, really cool and very cutting edge. And it's, it's meant to be a, a model for human disease. And so when you, when you read that paper and you're learning about human cortical organoids, then any question that you have about how these organoids work is going to be interesting and relevant, right? And then there's, there's, I've, I've also, for all of these papers that I've selected to feature on figure one lab, I've made sure that the data is accessible. Mm -hmm. Because that's also a major hurdle for new people who are new to computational biology is that you start looking for the data and it's just not there or it's not annotated so at find. all. Or, yeah. Yeah. Right. Or it's in this format that you don't know how to read into R or Python. So I've done that part as well and vetted, vetted these papers for you basically. And then... I've also provided Jupyter notebooks where I read in the data from these papers on interesting topics related to human health. And I've mm -hmm. processed it a little bit to get you to a point where now you can start having fun with the data. And so all you have to do is to run through my Jupyter notebook, and then it'll give you a UMAT plot at the end with all of your single cell transcriptomes and the mm -hmm. cell types labeled already. So I've gone through kind of the most boring and tedious part of the data analysis workflow mm. so that you can now start asking very open-ended questions of the data set to build your story. Mm. And the way I designed these Jupyter notebooks is I've kept it very, very bare bones because mm. it's going to, I want it to, to be similar to what you will actually do in an industry job, mm. which is you get an open-ended question and then you just have to go on the internet and find what you need to answer the question. Mm -hmm. And so figure one lab, unlike a lot of the tutorials out there and workshops, I'm not like taking you to the finish line at mm -hmm. all. I'm just opening the problem for you 
And then the, the, the user, the, the computational biology student still has to go through a fairly lengthy process of developing your question and then mm-hmm. answering them. Hey, Combio Cafe community, exciting news to share with you. We are opening up sponsorship opportunities for our podcast. If you're in the Combio field and want to reach a dynamic audience of scientists and leaders, this opportunity is for you. Picture your brand, company, or community featured in our episodes, reaching thousands of listeners. We offer tiered packages with shout outs, promotional materials, and even a sponsored episode. Your support fuels not only Compile Cafe's growth, but the growth of our nonprofit, the Black Women in Computational Biology Network. This helps us to bring more diverse perspectives to the forefront through our scientific storytelling. If you're interested and want to partner with us, please email podcast at blackwomencompio.org. Let's drive progress and build community in Compio together. So one question I have is in that in the way that you've structured it, you really put the emphasis on being able to ask those crucial questions and then use the computational approach to answer them. I think sometimes maybe, um, well, so if from your perspective, then is it that, you know, getting those initial UMAPs, doing that initial EDA, maybe that's something or, or steps that are a little bit more accessible to everyone, or are you saying maybe some of the value in what you'd actually be doing day to day for a company as a computational biologist comes from the other end of that? Does that question make sense? As opposed to like the pipe, the uh-huh. pipeline of like generating, aligning the data and pre-processing and all the boring stuff that you did done for people. Already. I mean, like, yeah, we know that's important, right? We all need to know how to do that. And maybe let's maybe those resources are more readily ac- accessible. Like I can learn pretty quickly how to run star or, you know, how to, you know, do some QC stuff. But you kind of you're kind of structuring the way that people interact with this in a way that allows them to be creative on the, on the other end. So we have our initial EDA, we have our initial, we know what the data looks like. What do we do with this? Would you agree? Or? Yeah, so figure one lab, or I call it S1L now. So it's designed, it's, it's not necessarily there to de-emphasize all of the pre, pre-processing steps, which are also super important. And you can definitely get jobs out of having those skills. but I think the existing training materials that are free online already go over that mm-hmm. that content. But what's what's missing then is the storytelling part. And right. I, I emphasize that on the GitHub page is that at the end of the day, to get a job, you need to tell a a fun story, an entertaining scientific story. And and I don't think a whole lot of resources out there really address that. And that's very much a, a part of day-to-day work in industry. You know, every time you present your findings, it, it, I at least I try to do it. I try to turn it into a story that then people can be impressed with. So they'll actually remember what I found in the data. And so that that's part of the skill is, or that, that storytelling skill is important for you when you interview for a job. Also, when you, after you get a job and you, you're on the job, you're continuing to be a storyteller pretty much every time you present something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that's really important. I remember in like grad school being like going in, like thinking like, this is science. This is the, you know, I do an analysis. These are the results, but it came it became much more like, how are you shaping together the narrative of what you're finding and how are you communicating its importance and its impact? And that's so like, uh, so important in the field. And I don't know if like it, it's more important in industry or academia. So I think people who want to go into either would really benefit from going through this practice of building out the story from their data. Yeah, and, and something else that came to mind is a lot of the the methods that we use in industry, they're not like that advanced, sorry to say. I think yeah. it's getting there. 
But like most of our day-to-day work is not building deep learning models. You know, mm-hmm. and most of our day-to-day work is making like scatter plots and box plots, mm-hmm. which you probably can learn how to do in high school. Mm-hmm. And and so I think psychologically, there's this big barrier where people think, oh, computational biology is so hard, but really like the packages out there to analyze RNA-seq data, bulk or single cell, it's it's already pretty nicely put together. And mm-hmm. they already have these like internal functions that you can just run on the data and it spits out these plots for you. Right. Mm-hmm. So like the, it actually has made it like beginner computational biology work a lot more accessible already. I just don't think people know that. They don't know that, oh, just go to Surat, just default to Surat or default mm-hmm. to Scampi, and you're probably in the right ballpark with your science. And then once you realize how accessible this kind of work is, then I hope then people can get inspired to really ask their fun scientific questions like I did with, with organoids because I was just really curious. Can you talk more about the like, storytelling aspect of it? Like, What are some different ways to develop your storytelling skills within science? You know, I would say the... The story that you want to tell when you're interviewing for an industry role is going to be somewhat different from if you're interviewing for an academic role. And for an academic role, you're really emphasizing the novelty of your finding. But in for industry roles, you don't necessarily have to have a novel finding. You need to show Mm -hmm. that what you've done is useful. Mm -hmm. And, And so the bar is, in a sense, a little bit lower. And so we're more free to actually just duplicate what someone else has done already and then take all of that and just apply it to a slightly different context. And so for, in terms of how I think about building a story for these interviews, the the, the framing the biological question or the hypothesis at the very beginning is the most time consuming part, the hardest part, but also the most interesting part. Because once you have that question in place, then Everything else that follows, I think, is not as hard because the methods are there, the data you just have to find, and the there's like standard plots and heat maps and whatnot that you can just make. And then you draw conclusions from it to address your question. But I think for a lot of people where they get stuck is not knowing what a good question looks like. So like for example, I had if you can you can totally totally ask a question like, Oh, how are how are macrophages? in the lung different from macrophages in the heart. And you go and find those data sets and you do your differential gene gene expression analysis, but that's not a hypothesis. That's just, well, I think they're different, but it's not specific enough. Like how, how do you think they're different? Mm -hmm. And, and can you tie that to a, a condition, right? Maybe you say, okay, macrophages in cystic fibrosis lung is going to express gene signature X more highly than normal lung. And that correlates with the severity of the, of the disease. Mm. You know, and that's where the, it's not even computational anymore. Right. That's just biology, right? That's, right? that's what biologists do on a daily basis. And that's also, and that's what we are. We are biologists. And that's mm-hmm. also what we have to do. And that's going to involve the, the person who wants to get the, these kind of bio jobs. You're going to have to read a good number of papers. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know if you saw this a couple of days or weeks ago where I, I posted an article basically urging people to learn how to read biology papers. Because I realized yeah. that sometimes that is not emphasized enough. And so you have mm-hmm. all of these comp bio enthusiasts who are actually not able to parse the, the pri- primary literature. Um, and mm-hmm. that really becomes a, a, a deficit or disadvantage to you. Could you give maybe one or two highlights from some of the tips you gave in that paper? Yeah. I mean, I basically just emphasize that you have to learn how to read papers. And, and that, <laughs> that, that, that article was addressed to, you're going to have to read papers. But people who are in masters or in bachelor's programs, and they think that they can just do cool machine learning methods, but no one's forcing them to read these papers. And I use the word force because it is so hard 
to begin. And you need probably a few years of constant practice to kind Mm -hmm. of bang your head against these academic papers to really get comfortable with it. And then in that article, I just give some tips on how to understand the papers and some setting some expectations. Like your first time reading these papers, it may take you 10 or 20 hours to get through five pages. You're going to be Googling every other sentence and you may still understand only 50% of the paper. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. That's already Mm -hmm. very good. Right. And then the other one main strategy that I highlight in the article is also that you want to take the, you want to take the PDF, the paper and take screenshots of all the elements that are spread throughout the paper. Cause you know, sometimes the figure is over here on one page, the caption is on another page, but the method is described like 17 pages later. And the text (laughs) is on a different page. So just pull all of all that information together yeah. into one PowerPoint slide for yourself and mm. then describe what's happening in that figure to yourself and make notes and turn that into your, your study note, basically. And once you do that enough times, then it, it, these biology papers really don't seem as intimidating. Mm. One thing that I'm curious about, I know you've been like in leadership roles, like group leader or more senior roles at your companies, how much does maybe your mentoring or your leadership style inform kind of how you are putting into perspective a lot of the resources for Figure One Lab or vice versa, right? Maybe how is what you're thinking about for Figure One Lab affect your leadership style today? So I was managing people mostly in my previous role at IFI Biotherapeutics. And basically what I do with new employees that join my team, new scientists, is what you will do in figure one lab. And so like, for example, I had, I had one intern who, you know, study applied math and also worked in a biology lab, but really had no experience with any of the data types that we're working with at the company. Mm. And I just sent her to the tutorial and gave her two weeks to see if she can go through it. And then we had our formal interview and I thought she did a really good job. And then on starting on the, the first day of work, I gave her a biological question to solve. And then I, I pointed her to a couple of papers, but told her like, you're gonna have to find more of these papers with relevant data sets to work with. And then here are some methods that you probably will find useful. And she was able to put together an analysis in about two weeks. You know, and, and she was a bachelor's yeah. level higher. And so I feel like figure one lab, it seems hard when I was designing it, but I feel like it's not too hard. Like it's definitely mm-hmm. doable for people who put in the time. Yeah. That's a really good example of like a, a concrete success story and also just how much the framework really seems to work for people who are coming into the field from so many different backgrounds. So, right. Yeah. I, can I just say something else about this? Yeah. I think, I think when I think of mentoring or being a supervisor to other scientists, I really, the word teaching comes up a lot. I feel like you can't really be a mentor in this field unless you're also a really good teacher. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something that isn't really practiced all that much in the workplace, at least in the industry where people realize that they actually have to teach their teammates, their more junior teammates to do things that they've never done before. And I think part of that is there's this fear of how much time that's going to take. Like I already, I'm already in eight hours of meetings every day. I cannot possibly afford to teach someone else how to do something new. But I think we overestimate how much time that takes. And we underestimate how smart people are and how quickly they can figure things out. Mm -hmm. And I think when I was at Hyvair Bio, I really experimented with this. I also wasn't sure how long that was going to take me. But for the most part, I feel like people learn very quickly. It's a matter of a few weeks or a few months before they really become fully independent, Mm -hmm. even without having that PhD training. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you definitely... It's clear that you've thought so much about just that, and, and, and it's clear that the way that you've structured and kind of have made the material approachable really keeps that in mind, just sort of that, that teaching approach to how 
that you're kind of sharing in, in a resource. I think, I think, I think there's a difference maybe that we've delineated, right? Where there's, you know, here's how to do this, or here's what you can do, or there's like a lot of advice, but I think you've really precipitated the concrete action steps and the outcomes, the like the learning objectives in a way that is approachable to different audiences, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm curious to know how you envision F1L growing as we're getting deeper into large scale proteomic and metabolomic data. Are you going to be kind of like on the prowl for those kind of data sets and adding them into the to the repository, or do you think you know, I also feel like some of the initial methods, analysis methods for both for these data sets are similar. But yeah, how do, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? That's a really good question. Um, I purposely decided to just stick with RNAC data for now, thinking that I would expand into these other data types. But I feel like as a learning resource, um, I think it's okay to actually just stick with RNAC data. Because if you can figure out how to work with RNAC data, it's not that far of a lead to figure out how to work with other types of omics data. At the end of the day, it's just a, a matrix of numbers, right? Um, you can almost like, like there's, uh, oh, what's that method called? Cytoff, you know, Cytoff data is like proteomics, but you can pretty much just analyze it with Surat, I think. Uh, and it gives you, you can get pretty similar results. Um, and so I feel like there's the, the biggest step is getting through the exercises now in the figure one lab, uh, and that will get you at least halfway through, uh, understanding how to work with other types of data. And also, um, I really emphasize on RNAC, RNAC data because that's the most popular and most available data type now still. Um, and also probably more affordable than most other data types, especially proteomics. Uh, and every paper out there, you'll always see RNAC data published alongside something else. That's almost like the, the bread and butter of every paper. Now you, you can't not have RNAC data. And then a lot of times that tends to be the most abundant data type in a study that all of the other data types that are more expensive to generate and more niche, they hang on the foundation of the RNAC data. And so if you have a good uh, intuition for what that RNAC data looks like and what it tells you, then it actually makes it easier. It enables you to ask questions of the other data types more. And also to answer your question, I, I don't have that much free time. And so I don't know at what point I will add other data types on there. Uh, and, and part of the job as a computational biologist is that you're just, you are, you're, you're comfortable with learning new things, right? So if you can learn one new thing and that new thing is RNA seq then you can probably just repeat that process 10 times and learn 10 other data types. I think it's the same with like learning a programming language or a spoken language, you know, we're learning a framework and kind of like a way to learn and know what to look out for and just kind of apply it. So. Yeah, I think you've really also highlighted some specific needs for the industry pipeline specifically and encouraging new learners to focus on biologically relevant or data that is relevant to human health, focus on how to storytell and really use, grow the data skills through that storytelling framework. Is there any other advice that you would give to other aspiring computational biologists who could be looking to get into biotech or industry or pharma. I don't know if you differentiate, but what other things might complement a strong portfolio? Um, I would actually say even before they get to the portfolio stage is to, if you want an industry job as a current comp bioscientist, is to start looking on LinkedIn one to two years in advance. I think most people that I speak with who want to get a job here, uh, they start too late. They start three months or six months in advance thinking that's pretty good. I would say it's one to two years. Uh, 
And this is the strategy that I used when I was trying to get into industry, where a year in advance, I was studying LinkedIn job posts to understand what people are hiring for. And I checked it religiously to understand what the trends are. And after you read a hundred different job descriptions, you realize like there's a couple of skills that everyone wants. And that's what you build your portfolio project on. Otherwise, you know, people go through their bachelor's or master's programs thinking like, oh yeah, the program will teach me what I need to get a job. It probably won't. You need to do that market research for yourself um, to figure out like, oh, everyone wants, wants me to understand p-values and principal component analysis. So when I learned that topic in my stats class, that one week, I need to understand that really, really well because I want to build that into my portfolio project so I can interview with, with that, with that um, PowerPoint slide. Yeah, that kind of plays on our previous podcast with Anissa Valentine, where we talked a lot about addressing the gap between what your skills are and what the job, you know, your future job looks like and finding what they're looking for and how you can get those skills. So yeah, one to two years out, that's a lot. One other question before we go is how are you thinking about the importance of accessibility for learning, particularly for people, not just, you know, anyone interested in getting into comp bio, but Running our network, BWCB, we're dealing with scientists from many different backgrounds, geographic locations, and we really also value storytelling in this context because it helps share information in ways that people can relate to. But it's already on GitHub. We know that. We know that it's like many people can access it. But are there any other approaches or considerations you're taking in terms of making this type of resource widely available or approachable to people from different backgrounds. Yeah, I'll, I'll address some of the, the more tangible accessibility issues. And then I'll talk about like a long-term dream that I have. But the, the, the immediate issues with Figure to One Lab is, you know, I, I do everything on there with my personal computer. So I don't have like a, access to a university subscriptions to journals. And so I only feature papers that are open access. Um, and, and I only use data sets that are open access and easy to download. Um, everything on there, I'm, I, I'm imagining there's a stay at home parent in somewhere in the US who had like 30 minutes of free time a day to do this. And they have a regular laptop to work on they should be able to do figure one lab exercises and create their portfolio projects. So that, that's my, the bar that I set. Um, and then in terms of accessibility for a learning computational biology long-term uh, and for everyone, I, I think my, my dream is that a school like Georgia Tech would offer an online master's degree and make their classes, their computational biology classes affordable on that degree, which they've already done for computer science, right? You can get that whole degree for something like five to $10,000. And it's a legit degree. Like the classes, if you've seen it, are just like very advanced computer science classes. And, and if, you know, and this is, I don't want to say, well, I'll say it. Uh, this is kind of a shame to all of the other master's programs that are charging like 75 to 100 for a master's degree when Georgia Tech has shown that you can do it for way cheaper uh, while people are working full time, right? So you can do these degrees part time so you don't have to give up your job. And I think that financial barrier is a huge uh, hurdle that people can get across to get into the field. Because one, we're either asking them to be broke for six years in a PhD, which a lot of people can afford. Um, and then two, you're asking them, well, if you're not going to get a PhD, then you need to get a master's. But that's also super expensive. And then you have to quit your job for that. So I would like to see uh, more educational opportunities like the one offered um, by Georgia Tech as an online part-time degree that people can do while they're working as a research assistant, you know? 
And if you're working as a research assistant in a, in a university lab right out of college, you get your tuition benefit, tuition reimbursement benefit, which pays for the entire master's at Georgia Tech online. And then you also have access to uh, data coming out of your lab and you can use that to build your portfolio project. And then boom, you got it. That's, that's my dream. Yeah. And it's not, essentially all of this, all of this can be done online for free at some point, right? There's, they've already done, they've shown that you can do this with computer science. And I don't think CompBio is harder than computer science. I feel like it's doable. What do you think? Have you seen, have you seen models that really exemplify this kind of accessibility for learning and training computational biologists? I was going to mention like there's stuff on Coursera, right? There's like biological data science stuff. So there could be individual courses from like Stanford or wherever. There are other organizations that might do certain types of training modules or just like quick how-to videos. One is a newer organization called BioInform Her. It's specifically for African women in bioinformatics. But in terms of like what you are emphasizing here is that literal outcome, like a legitimate degree that you can get from this while you're actually working. I haven't seen necessarily, you know, outside of the the undergrad programs that might have an undergraduate curriculum, I haven't seen anything relatively accessible to people who might not be at the bachelor's level or someone who could just be looking to change careers. I don't know, Melissa, have you? No, yeah, I haven't seen anything like that. I think that would be, that would be really awesome. Yeah. And if we're talking about programs like the Morehouse Initiative, where there seems to be funding, there seems to be at least even like federal funding support for these types of biological data science initiatives, I, I definitely think that there is a gap and a need there that could be closed with something like this that people can do while they're working and earning a living yeah. wage. And then I think Kristen Reinhardt from North Carolina a and I think she's also leading leading a comp bio training thing, but I'm not sure if it's for grad students or anybody that wants to join, but I know that's definitely like a government funded situation. But do you get like a certificate or? You probably get a certificate, but not like a master's degree, like, mm -hmm. like we're dreaming of here. Would you think, do you think? Uh, Morehouse would be interested in offering that kind of uh, part-time, mostly remote training because it would be pretty much the first of its kind in the nation and a lot of people would pay for it. Even without tuition reimbursement from their employer, they would just pay out of pocket for that kind of training. Yeah, yeah. I think it's approachable. Well, again, I'm not at Morehouse. <laughs> we are like loosely connected to Melissa Davis. But like, I think that's the thing, right? I, I think that's that's a great place to at least pilot the program mm -hmm. where there's already funding and support for training graduate students. And, you know, and it seems like the online model thing is something that universities have been open to in the past especially hbcus i know morehouse does have other like online stem degrees that are definitely not comp bio or they might have other online degrees that they've been able to flip with support from other large don donations so yeah we're brainstorming here but i i i think we concluded that we definitely see an opportunity there and would hope to see future initiatives kind of bring that into fruition. Because it's not always about the undergrad, like summer research programs or the, you know, quick internships. Like it, it does need to be long term and sustained and give something to people at the end of the experience, something that they can actually use to leverage 
future employment opportunities. There's so much, I think there's a lot of that boot camp or certificate culture in the com in the computer science space, you know, for like programming and stuff, but we don't necessarily always see the same replicated in the comp bio space, you know, between bio. So yeah. Yeah. We really need that. So let me know if you see other opportunities like this pop up. I'm always looking for them. Probably like a couple of times a week. I'm checking online to see what new uh, resources or programs you might put together that are affordable. Yeah, for sure. Well, with, yeah, we'd love to stay in touch too and see if there's a way that we can get our members involved in that. I know we have a lot of people in between careers or switching into ComBio and would definitely also, this would be good initiatives for other organizations that have people in the ComBio space wanting to gain industry relevant skills. I think that's the key there. Alrighty. Well, Dean, thank you so much for everything you shared today. We definitely have a lot to think about. And Figure One Lab is really, I think it's going to be a really great resource for a lot of people. And I'm really happy to see it gaining more traction within our community. I hope that more people can take advantage of it. To our audience, thank you so much for listening today. Thank you for returning as a listener to Comp Bio Cafe. Again, if you have any questions you'd like answered, or questions for Dean, you can email us too. We'd like to share them on the show. Send us an email at podcast at blackwomencompbio.org or you can leave a voicemail at 302-715-BWCB. And once again, I'm Melissa. We do this all the time. <laughs> I'm Janae. <laughs> all right. I'm Melissa. And I'm Janae. See you guys in the next episode. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>